Welcome to Core Values, the All Things Broken Arrow Public Schools podcast, part of the AeroVision Podcast Network. I'm your host, Greg Spencer, alongside Broken Arrow School Superintendent, Mr. Chuck Perry. Chuck, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good to be here. Awesome. Uh, so we're back to school. Uh, we've been in school for a couple weeks now. And tell us a little bit about our first guest that we have here today. I am very excited to uh, introduce Jason Jadamski better known as JJ to uh, those that have worked with him or know who he is. Um, when I think about the impact he's had on Broken Arrow Public Schools and Broken Arrow High Schools, um, it just really probably means more to me um, than about anything that I've seen happen at the school district in a lot of different ways. Uh, he and I coached uh, against each other over the years at Broken Arrow and Union and had some good rivalries uh, between us. We both grew up in the local area with um, just playing soccer from a young age. And um, when Dr. Mendenhall, who was a superintendent at the time, walked into my office, or I walked into his office, and he said, um, you know, do you know anybody that might want to be a school uh, activities director? And I said, I've got a guy. Jason Jadamski, and at that time he was at Bentonville High School as an assistant principal there, academic assistant principal, and I said I can give him a call, and I didn't think he'd have much of a chance to uh, pull him over to BA, but the more we talked and shared the vision of what we wanted at uh, Broken Arrow, it, it worked out great, and he's been in that role. I'll let him talk about that some, but um, he's gone off and has created a great business as being to schools all across the country uh, in regard to culture and uh, creating a great school spirit. And uh, today he is currently in the role of school culture coach for Broken Arrow Public Schools and wants to make an impact on our sites. And I think it's very important that, you know, uh, culture is not a thing that we have hanging on the wall as a poster, but we actually walk the walk and uh, provide our principals and our directors the tools to uh, make it a great place to come and uh, be a, a teacher, a, a cafeteria worker, a custodian, a maintenance person. Doesn't matter. Have them come to BA because when we have great employees, our end goal is great students um, and the impact that we'll have on their lives. So um, with all that being said, I'd like to introduce JJ, Jason Jadamski. JJ, welcome to the show. We, we've had you on here before, right? We had you on here last year, right? Yeah, I was, yeah, I was on the uh, podcast last year. Yeah, happy to be back. Excited to be back. Tell us a little bit about what was that first, what was that phone call like when you received it? I guess would have been, you know, nine, ten years ago now. Yeah, I was actually at a family reunion. Uh, it was a Saturday, and I, I look at my phone, and Chuck Perry's name's on there, and I was like, do I hang up on? No. Nah. <laughs> I was like, you better answer this, man. You know, so, like, Chuck and I would, would talk every once in a while just because we're in the education world and things like that, and I saw his name, and I thought, I better answer that call. And, um, you know, he he just kind of shared that Broken Arrow was at a place that, um, you know, change is a constant in education, and, and Broken Arrow was in a place where change was happening, and um, uh, my understanding was they were just looking at this as an opportunity to like kind of really try to move the school forward in regard to the student culture at Broken Arrow High School. And so that's something that is, I've been always really passionate about. It's in my heart and did a little bit of that in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, had a great experience with a mentor of mine that um, really shaped their campus. And uh, I was really excited about just even the possibility that that job exists because if you go to California, there's thousands of schools that have that job. In Oklahoma, there's not very many. So that job existing right here, and especially in like my home, uh, was very exciting for me. So what was that first year like for you? Obviously, you know, I, I think I got here your second year. I believe you had been here for a year. So I, I, I got to see a year's worth of change and then really feel like those next couple group of kids just really, you know, took on to it quick. But what was that first year like? The first year, you know, I really was trying to, I'm not a very patient person. I, uh, my, I'm on, I'm pushing on the gas pretty hard most of the time, but I really wanted to kind of like observe and learn and, um, figure out like what traditions and beliefs and values and norms and stuff like that we had across our campus with students. 
Um, and again, change is a constant education. Broken Arrow for a long time was known for um, really strong student council, student activity, student section, things like that. And I think just, you know, just like in any school, when change happens, sometimes th those things fade away a little bit and Broken Arrow had been fading for a little bit. And um, I which is which is easy to do when you have the gr you know ever growing student population that we do. I mean, it, a lot of people think things would be easier, but that's not necessarily the case. No, it's not. And um, I, I I quickly learned that we were kind of just a, a student body um, that lacked connectedness, lacked an identity as a student body. And um, the norms were very much like, oh, we just don't do those things in Broken Arrow. So when you ask my first year was like, I, I specifically remember walking down the street at Homecoming Parade and uh, Mr. Perry, I think he stopped, I don't remember the question he asked, but he stopped me and like, how's it going? And I said, well, I think we're gonna have 50 kids at our homecoming dance. And we had around 100 and 50 of those kids were like kind of student council leadership kids. And then uh, I guess 50 of their friends showed up. We hired a DJ that graduated the year before for 500 bucks. We had some moms <laughs> make brownies and some waters and that was our homecoming dance. And, well, and now just to clarify, yeah. you know, we have a DJ that basically the same DJ that's at everything, DJ Randy, shout out to DJ Randy, yeah. he's awesome. And then we had, you know, even pre-pandemic and since, I mean, talk about the number of kids that, you know, Christian Wellborn and all of them are able to get to dances. Yeah, I mean, the, the evolution just even there, like, and we, when I go work with schools, I actually show them the highlight video that Mr. Greg Spencer made uh, of Broken Arrow High School and of 2017, we won that nation's most oh, yeah, high school yeah. contest. And I show schools that and I say, let me tell you about 2013. In 2013, our last home football game, we had 28 students in the stands. Wow. And I know that because I counted them. And <laughs> uh, we had our jungle squad, our student section leaders that year. We started the year with 14. One of those kids showed up to our last home football game in 2013. Wow. Uh, and then you start talking about Aloha Bash was started back then. And I think we had, I don't know, 150, 200 kids show up and it was like free or something. We were just trying to get kids to show up on campus. And now, you know, we've grown those things to where, you know, you'll have 1,500, 2,000 people show up. Uh, and it's just continued to evolve over time. Christian Wilborn's now the activities director and they keep pouring into the program. I think their leadership class enrollment, um, when I was here, we had 25 my first year. Then we went to two sections. Then we grew it to four and six and 10. I think they're still, uh, I think they actually maybe turned some kids away this year because they had so many applicants. So um, it's nice to see that the, the kind of the steps we started, the kind of fire we ignited here is continuing to grow and burn and now you're seeing it spread to Baffa's doing tiger camp and i think at middle schools and not too distant future we'll be doing something similar to tiger camp to welcome new students on campus so it's neat to, neat to see that evolution as a district as well talk about one of the things that you uh spent some time on campus here the first few weeks of school and you noticed there wasn't um a lot of students there weren't a lot of students that were wearing broken arrow tigers shirts or um you know, had the um, branding on it, and which is a, uh, no doubt, a connection, sense of pride in your district when you're wearing that and what you did about that. I thought that uh, was a pretty cool idea. Yeah, it, it, on any campus, doesn't matter if your campus is 200 or 3,800. Um, I think it's very important for students to have an opportunity that's a very low risk opportunity to be a part of something bigger than themselves. And to me, a student section is a really easy way to do that. If you can offer some sort of like we did it, we, we started the jungle. So we had a group of leadership student council kids that we kind of brainstormed on stuff. We came up with the jungle because we're tigers and we came up with three words, loud, proud tigers, because we wanted that to be our identity. We want to be loud. We want to be proud about who we are. We're from BA and that, that we're broken arrow tigers. And um, we started the jungle and we try to make that jungle jersey. We called it a jungle jersey instead of just a t-shirt. We thought that was kind of a cool thing to do. But we wanted as many kids as possible to have that that jungle jersey because for us, that was their identity, right? Let's be one student body. And so I always talk about what does something look like, sound like, and feel like. And so um, I really wanted to create a, a place where when you looked at a student section, it doesn't have to be every time because we do themes, but it looks like one student body together. It sounds like one student body together, right? And um, that jungle jersey was a big component of that. And what I love is it was a couple of years into it. And, you know, summers here are hot. It's 100 and something degrees. And I was driving down county line, and it was 100 and something degrees that day. And I saw a student walking with their jungle jersey on, and it's like a three-quarter inch yeah. sleeve. <laughs> it's not a short sleeve. <laughs> no, it's not, a, it's not a thin shirt, you know. And um, I saw a kid, and that just spoke to me because I was like, man, that, that shows that kid has a lot of pride and love 
or being a broken arrow tiger by wearing that shirt in the middle of summer when school's not in session, when it's 100 degrees walking down county line. And so that was the goal, right? How do we get kids to feel like they're part of this thing bigger than themselves? And the vehicle for doing that was the student section jungle jersey and it wasn't just about athletics we also were like how can we support our arts programs and academic things and um and that's still that's a process on every campus it's something you're always working on to to be the best version of yourselves right now get two hundred dollars from ttcu federal credit union when you open a new checking account with direct deposit what would you buy with two hundred dollars cars race cars my own apartment 100 coloring books and a puppy. <laughs> or maybe some groceries and a tank of gas. $200 for whatever works for you from TTCU. Because life is better in balance. Uh, here we are 10 years later, or almost 10 years later, and we were doing a photo shoot yesterday, and, and one of the kids in, in our class had a jungle jersey on during the photo shoot and, and wanted to, and actually made a point to, she, she wanted to do a pose where she, we had the camera on her front and then she turned back and pointed to what's on the back. And so that, that was something that she wanted to make sure that she got in our intro video for GMBA. So that's pretty cool. And um, talk about JJ just a little bit. You know, our end goal is to pr provide a great academic experience here in Broken Arrow. That's why we have school. And talk about the research that shows the connectedness, how that impacts academic achievement. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Perry. One of the kind of transformative experiences I personally had as an educator is when I was in Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, I had the good fortune of going to a national dropout convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And I went to a session by Grossmont Union School District. And Grossmont Union School District is, uh, at the time, they were uh, a district that had a changing population. Um, and they were trying to figure out how can we help our kids be more successful uh, during this change. And they wrote a grant, and it was for a three-day, two-night orientation camp for their freshmen. And it was a pretty significant grant, like $150,000. They literally bus all their freshmen to a camp. They spend three days and two nights there at the camp. And I was blown away by their session, but there was a component of their session that really caught me. And they presented this uh, CDC report. And the CDC report was about school connectedness. And it was research, a summary of research over 50 years in education. And that summary of research said that the number one factor that will influence school success is family connectedness. Well, we can't do much about that, right? We cannot do much about how connected a kid is to a family, but the second most influential factor in school success is school connectedness. And we can do something about school connectedness. So if that's the number one overall factor that's going to influence a student's uh, success academically on a campus, man, we should really invest in that school connectedness component so our kids can be the most successful they can be on a campus. And it's something that you're not really taught in educator school. Um, I think it's in people's hearts, but a lot of times we don't talk about it and we don't invest in that. But man, if that's the factor that we can really pour ourselves into that's gonna help our kids be more successful, in my opinion, we should pour into it. And it's not even just school success. That report also talked about pr protective factors. So if they're more content connected to school, they're less likely to use drugs and alcohol and make bad decisions. So when you look at it, you go like, golly, why would we not invest in that and strengthen that school connected as much as possible? And, and that's very important to me that people see um, how that all ties together. It's not just fluff. We're very intentional about it because um, we know it will impact the classroom and um, impact these kids well beyond their high school years. And, and a shout out also to our um, current student activities director, uh, Christian Wellborn and her staff with Derek Drake and Taylor Thompson because um, they are putting out such a good product that, again, students are uh, coming to and want to be a part of. Uh, Mary Fowler does a Tiger Challenge class, and that has an impact on our school campus. So I appreciate all of uh, those that are carrying on this legacy. Well, a couple weeks ago, in fact, and two weeks from, from today, I talked with JJ. We had our first pep rally, which I believe since the fall of 2019, uh, if I'm correct. And so... Talk to us a little bit about what that, well, actually, let me tell a story first, because uh, early this summer, Christian Wellborn called me and she said, 
hey, do you have any videos that I could show the kids because they've never seen one of our big pep rallies in the gym? And I thought about that for a second. I was like, wow, you know, these kids were at the freshman academy the last time we got to do this. And so, you know, the last last year they did some mobile pep rallies the last couple of years and things like that. But we, we think about these kids, these seniors and these this group of kids that we have right now, they've they've missed on a lot of these activities that have become traditions, but we're seeing those things come back and the pep rally couldn't have gone any better. It was, it was fantastic. It was well-planned. Talk a little bit about that and what your impressions were of that. And and just looking at the the kids and how much fun they had. It, it, when I, I'm I'm lucky I get to work with some schools across the nation and you talk to any school across the nation and it's the same thing. Kids have not had their their normal has been different the last couple of years, and so they're doing their first pep rallies. They're doing their first events in person, and uh, it's interesting to hear that some schools are are kind of immediately getting back to quote normal before the pandemic hit. You know, they're going like, "Man, our pep rally was awesome and full of energy," and some people are going like, "Our pep rally was." honestly really bad yeah. because no one knew what to do or how to do it and there was no energy and even student section i was at the union game the other night and i'm looking over there or it was the wasso game sorry the wasso game the other night and i'm looking at our student section in the fourth quarter it's still full of kids they're chaining 4ba and it's like man you know i feel like our normal is coming back a little faster than most people's which is really awesome but the pep, the pep assembly was great because it's it's really been the first time in a couple of years kids have been in the same place uh just kind of having fun feeling the energy uh getting Getting to like again be a part of something bigger than themselves. That's to me what a pep rally is, uh, and getting them to go like, "Hey, we're all Broken Arrow Tigers." Um, no matter if I'm in band or choir or uh, Tulsa Tech or soccer or it doesn't matter, right? We are all Broken Arrow Tigers, and that's what a pep assembly, in my opinion, does. It, it lets everybody get connected on like, "Hey, we are like one school, one student body." And I thought it went real. I loved the energy and being in there because it's been a while since we've experienced that. Yeah, it, it felt like old times again, and it really you know, made me ha- you know gl- thankful that that we always filmed the pep rallies because it was important for those kids to be able to see some how big some of the the prior ones back in the day were and they were able to pull off something just as good i mean the kids were really into it and it was, it was really effective and a fun time it's great um in addition to that we recently had aloha bash for the first time uh, I th- actually they had it last year uh, i think for the first time in a couple of years but that was event you started correct right and so it's always neat to see, you know, it got postponed a couple of weeks due to some weather, but the kids, you know, always having a fantastic time with that. Uh, and then they've, you know, there's going to be a ton of other activities coming up soon. Um, and, and if I could jump in there, I, I really do appreciate our uh, board of education and their leadership over the last couple of years that um, wanted kids in school and that connectedness. I look at the pride Broken Arrow and how they excelled so much at the uh, Grand Nationals in Indianapolis um, uh, this year ago in November. It's I think a lot of that attributes to they, they kept practicing uh, during that time period where a lot of schools weren't, and it wasn't easy. It took a yeah. lot of work, and uh, they did it. And again, when I think about bouncing back with our school spirit so quickly, I think it's because we made it a priority to be in schools and uh, be in school as much as we could. And again, appreciate our board support of that. Recently, you've had to put your life on hold and we're with you in this. At Ascension St. John, we're now open for appointments and we are fully prepared for your safety and our care. As we open our doors again, our doctors, nurses, and care teams will continue to wear personal protective equipment. We've taken even more steps to clean and stringently disinfect all areas. We will maintain distancing in our waiting rooms and will continue to limit visitors. And we will still screen all staff to protect their health and yours. Our emergency rooms are here 24 seven. Please do not delay care. We're still delivering babies and performing surgeries. And we're open for your appointments from specialists in surgical care to routine care and health screenings. Ask us about virtual visits. Ascension St. John continues to care for you, as we have been for almost a century. Thank you for trusting us. And speaking of things that we haven't had in a couple of years, we got to have our first back to school kickoff about a month ago already. And you guys were both very, very big parts of that. Talk about, you know, Chuck, talk about what it means to you. And then JJ coming and, and speaking at that and just how successful that event was. Well, it's a, it's a key um, 
time for our entire district because every single employee, a lot of people forget we have 2,400 employees in the district. Uh, we are Broken Arrow's largest employer. And to pull all of them together uh, over two sessions in, in one day takes a lot of work. And it gives me a chance to kind of uh, talk about the message for the year and what the theme is. And um, we focused on this is home because of you and talking about you. It's because what makes this such great district is all the people there uh, that we have that just pour into the lives of our students every day. It's not because of the superintendent. It's, it's because of every single person out there. Again, uh, you know, I kind of look at if, if, if you are a maintenance a uh, worker or a custodian, you're an educator because you're committed to all of our students in a unique type of way to provide um, that experience that our that our kids need. And um, I talked a lot about let's get back to the joy of having school again and teaching. Um, I want our teachers to feel that why they got into the profession in the first place. And we're not we made a decision that we weren't going to introduce any new curriculum, no new initiatives this year. And I want teachers to build relationships with students, one, and two, teach their content. And I think that covers about 90% of what should be happening in the classroom every day. Well, and I, I want to mention that when, you know, that was the theme of your speech that, that he, and I was at both sessions and both times it got applause from the teachers. So back to basics was a big thing for them. I think it resonated. We've, we've made uh, school in, in a lot of ways too complicated and it's, it's a simplicity of, of focusing on our students and meeting them um, where they're at. And, uh, you know, talking to Derek Blackburn, I, I think, and I was guilty of this and I think he was kind of speaking to me in a way of, making excuses about because of COVID, because of COVID, because of COVID. And he said, we just got to, you know, meet kids where they're at. I mean, there were kids that had to endure World War II uh, back in the day. And um, you don't make excuses and say we can't get them caught up. You do everything and you fight for those kids. And so that was a big message. Um, we really want um, to focus on having order in schools, too. Um, I think it's important there's such a negative perception uh, nationally about public schools, and uh, I want our parents to have a trust that this is a safe place to send their students, and um, because they're um, kids, they sometimes make some poor choices, and there's some consequences of it, and um, we're going to deal with that, but and we're going to still, you know, love on those kids and help them uh, get their receive the education that they're entitled to. But um, I, I feel strongly that people need to have confidence in their local school, and uh, we've made a commitment to that. JJ, one of the things that you did that I thought was really cool uh, towards the end of your speech is when you when you brought the the two teachers on, on stage and, and got everybody to cheer for them, and one was a little bit louder than the other. You know, talk a little bit about the speech that you gave that day, some of the feedback that you got, and then particularly that event or that that moment, and 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 where you got the idea for that. Uh, yeah. So uh, the the part of that speech is, um, yeah, I, I I bring two people up uh, on stage, and then I have them. Somebody has to take them out of the facility for a minute, and I just coach the audience. I just say, hey, do me a favor. When the first person comes up, they're going to talk about like their favorite meal and why it's their favorite meal. Treat them like great, like you are now, you're being super respectful. Uh, the second person that comes up, I want you to like hop out of your chair, freak out, give them a ton of energy, scream, yell for them, right? We'll have you sit down when they say their favorite meal. It doesn't matter if it's chicken feet, right? You go chicken feet, my favorite, and you freak <laughs> out. Uh, and then we'll talk about their experience. And so um, we had two people come up, we uh, sent them out, we um, do that little thing. And then we have a conversation just about like, you know what, um, how you treat people creates emotion in them. And so usually I try to get the shyer one of the two on the stage to be the second one that feels yeah, all the energy because yeah. it's a little awkward for them when they're shy, but mm -hmm. you'll see them smile. Because the other guy definitely was not shy. Yeah, you're correct. <laughs> that you're guy correct. was very outgoing. Yeah, yeah. And, and 
but it's just a conversation of, look, these little micro behaviors that we engage in every single day, those are really the culture builders. Culture is yeah. not built in a day. Culture is built daily, and it's built daily through all those micro behaviors. And so um, I was just trying to really shine a light on like, hey, why are these micro behaviors really important? And um, I'm, I'm going to write a book one day. People always say like, hey, you should write a book about school culture, and it's going to be your candy cart doesn't make your culture great or something like that because there are so many people out there, school leaders like, oh, I got a candy cart and gave my teachers candy and like everything's <laughs> great like i mean that's still a good thing don't get me wrong but the more important things are just those micro behaviors that happen thousands of times a day across a campus um so that was the purpose of it and i got that idea i mean i'm going to tell you i saw that probably 20 years ago i saw somebody do something similar to camp or something and i've just always had it in my brain and then about 10 years ago i started using it just to kind of like you know, it's a, a good little demonstration in my in my book to just kind of make a point about those little micro behaviors and how you treat people creates emotions inside them. And when I work with students, I talk about when you walk in a classroom and if I see Mr. Perry and he's my BFF and I go, what's up, Mr. Perry? And then you're sitting next to Mr. Perry and I don't even look at you. That communicates yeah. something. The phrase is everything counts because everything communicates. So that was the the purpose of, of that little component of the speech. And then the feedback on the speech, you know, um, I actually felt way more pressure speaking here than anywhere else because like this is my home. It's people I know and love. Not that I don't care when I go somewhere else and speak, but there's just not this connection across the audience yeah. with people. Um, well, and they're seeing you for the first time. A lot of people in that audience have seen you a lot of times. So it's like you got to bring your A game no matter what because it's they've, they've seen it. You That's know, correct. Yeah. But it's been neat. Just um, I've been on campuses uh, as school started and it, it's neat to meet people and go like, Hey, I really enjoyed your speech. And what I love is when they say like, Hey, you, when you said this, like that really stuck with me. So that means I know they're just not going, Hey, that's the bald dude that talked at the thing. Right. Yeah. They're like, Hey man, when you said this thing that resonated with me, that's the part I love. Talk a little bit about your new role in the district and your message about adults on campus and why this is so important. The work that you're doing. Yeah. So, uh, the, the basic level, school culture is a combination of staff culture and student culture. So there's two subcultures. And my role is a school culture coach. So my role is to support sites and departments in the district from a school culture perspective. So how can we be really intentional to create the culture we want so we're not drained by the culture we have? And schools are not designed for adults to connect as people. And I'll use my wife as I and I as an example. Um, anybody out there that has a significant other person in their life, when life gets really busy, there's, I'm going to assume because it happened to me and my wife that there's a point when you look at your significant other person and you say, what is going on and what's your name? Because I don't even remember because we never see each other. And the same, and then my wife and I just had to have a conversation about my wife said, Hey, what if we just start going for walks? Our kids were eight, eight at the time. And, uh, you know, when they're eight, you can leave them at home for like five or six days by themselves. Right. <laughs> we, so, we've just <laughs> discovered that in the last six months. Or so. right, I was like, yeah, yeah we, we live really close to everything. We can, <laughs> we can go make a quick errand. That's right. So our kids were eight. We were like, hey, we can go for a walk in the neighborhood for 20 minutes. And um, if we make that systematic, something that my wife and I consistently do, then that gives my wife and I a chance to connect uh, and, and continue to maintain and build our relationship. But schools aren't designed that way. They're not designed for adults to connect as people. And that affects the camp, the the culture yeah. of a campus. And so uh, part of my role is going to be working with sites and apartments about how can we re can create some time with the adults so they can connect as people before professionals. And let's, we say relationships are very important, but when you ask anybody in any campus around the nation, you say relationships are important, but, but what actions do you take? They'll usually go like, oh, we do like a morning coffee once every month. And I'm like, if I took my wife on a date once every month and that was it, we would not be married. So that same approach needs to apply to a campus and to departments. And it's just about strengthening those connections. And I believe, and I know Mr. Perry, you've said this before and I'll let you speak to it, but you know, when you have those deeper connections and you are investing time in the relationship component, it doesn't mean we're always just fun. It means we can actually raise the level of our expectation and performance collectively. And Mr. Perry, I'll let you kind of speak yeah, to that a little I, bit. I just think um, when everybody's rowing in the same direction, um, you can have higher expectations. And, uh, you know, that's something that's important to me with our staff and um, even my immediate team, my cabinet that I work with. Um, I, I, JJ uses the term people before professionals. Um, I think it's important that you do know what's going on in a um, co-worker's life, not anything personal or any 
thing like that, but have a, a understanding where they're coming from and what makes them tick. And I think once you find those things out, it's it's a more powerful organization. And I, you know that's not just schools. I think if you'd read any uh, success book in the business world, it's going to tell you the exact same thing. So yeah. we're just trying to uh, carry that out. And again, you said it. Culture didn't happen by accident. It's you got to be intentional about it. And we talked about that CDC report about the kids, and the same is going to be true with adults, right? If we can connect their connectedness to Broken Arrow Public Schools and their department, their site, then we're going to be able to increase their performance. It's the same with adults as it is with kids. We're just uh, kids with bigger bodies and less hair, usually on our heads and stuff like that. <laughs> but same thing. And I, you know, I, I've really um, been impressed with our um, chief operating officer, Larry Shackelford. Um, he's a former superintendent, so he gets it. But I, I've talked a lot about the most important hire you make in a school district is the building principal because they have so much influence over the teachers they hire. They, they're the connector between the school district and the parents. And I've really challenged him as an operations person over maintenance and construction and custodials to make sure those principals are getting everything they need. And he has taken that and run with it and has connected with their principals where they don't feel like they're on an island in their uh, sites and he'll sit down and, and talk with them and they one, if Larry can do one thing it's talk it so is, they, it <laughs> is and uh, they, they feel good about being able to uh, share some of their challenges with with him and it's really created a, a, a lot of uh, great culture across the district with just the work he's done and and you could say well he just needs to worry about um, you know, repairing leaks and uh, fixing air conditioners. He does all that. But when you go that next step, it, it's, it's a whole, it's an, it's another level. Yeah. Speaking of Larry, I think he would be a, a good future guest for, for, to get him on here to talk about the 1997 Grove Ridge runners. <laughs> uh, you know, Larry used to be officed over by, by me and I'd, I'd stop by and talk to him. So I, he actually coached against me. He was a Grove. I, I grew up in Miami, baseball and basketball. And, and he he was he was on the coaching staff of maybe one of the the best high school baseball teams I've ever seen, 1997 Grove Ridge Runners, and he he could probably do a whole podcast about that team. <laughs> For families who like to build their wealth while staying liquid, we have flexible rate CDs to keep your funds working hard even when you're not. First National Bank of Broken Arrow. The right balance. Before we wrap things up, a uh, couple things. Uh, Chuck, JJ, both of you, if you guys want to talk about anything that's coming up soon that you want to mention, some events that we have coming, maybe uh, you know a project that you're working on, uh, anything that we need to make sure people know about uh, before we get to the, some fun stuff at the end. I mean, from my end, uh, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, right? What, isn't that what Kramer used to say on, <laughs> on Seinfeld or something? But um, I, I think from my end, there's uh, at least one site um, that I'm working deeply with that I'm really excited about uh, an opportunity we have over the next couple months there um, to uh, create a moments, create momentum. And so you want to create a series of moments that create momentum on a campus or with a group of people. So I'm really excited about uh, the opportunity we have on that site to create a start to create a series of moments that make that campus feel a little bit closer and tighter. Um, so again, I don't, I don't want to like talk, you know, give yeah. it, give anything away, but like, it's it, like, I have a meeting at one o'clock today about it. So um, I'm excited about that that work and I think uh, immediately that campus will start to feel closer and tighter by creating this uh, a couple series of moments in sequence so I'm excited about that work I think um, one of the big things that we've hit this year the milestone of 20,000 yeah. students in the district for the first time ever uh, with our student enrollment we've been hovering about 19.5 got as low as 18 something uh, during COVID, but um, Broken Arrow, the city is exploding. Um, you know, the chamber's done a great job with all their 
uh, businesses they're bringing in, and we've got housing starts all over the district. Yeah, and that's the thing about Broken Arrow. There's still so much room for growth with just the, the land that we have and everything. It is, and um, so we're really going to have to look. Um, one thing that's important to me is manageable class sizes for our teacher, uh, for our teachers. Um, we're in a time period right now that we're seeing the beginnings of a great teacher shortage across the state. And it concerns me as a superintendent that we uh, get quality teachers in our classrooms because I feel like our kids deserve the best. And to retain them and to recruit the best, we've got to be doing some uh, things really well. And one of those is managing the class sizes. So we'll be um, looking at some of our elementary sites that may be exploding. Um, you look at Rosewood Elementary and we have 100 plus new kids there this year. We wow. grew as a district uh, by 600 plus 650 students, which is a, a, a brand new elementary school. So keeping is, up is that just because there's a lot of housing districts out that way yes, being built? Yes, um, and so just balancing that out and probably have to redistrict in some areas is a really big thing. And um, so that's you know our, our focus right now is um, starting that process. Also want to talk real quick about the Tiny Tigers Learning yeah. Center. Um, it's our uh, new daycare learning center for um, our employees that have children from six weeks to four years old when they uh, start early childhood. And we feel, again, this is a unique out-of-the-box way of thinking to uh, attract the best uh, for our students and offering that at a, a lower cost than they could find in uh, the private sector, and if you, it's out there at Arrow Springs, uh, early childhood, and it's state of the art. Um, you know, there's video monitoring. Monitoring, you can check on your phone all day uh, to That's see awesome. your child, and uh, we're excited to see that grow. And uh, the team, David Sutton and his team, have done a great job opening that. And um, there's a lot of DHS requirements that you've got to abide by to run something of that magnitude and they're all on board the, the people that we've hired and they just have a passion for making an impact and again it's not just daycare it's why we've titled it a, a learning center mm -hmm. we're teaching age-appropriate things for those students which are basic babies but they're they're, they're our students in a way yeah, too. <laughs> yeah for sure uh, so before we wrap this this up, I want to get a couple things from you guys. Uh, I know you both went on some pretty good vacations this year. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you – let's start with JJ. Tell us a little bit about what you guys did this summer. Man, you had an interesting oh, yeah, story and yeah. everything. <laughs> my, my, my wife and I, we've been planning like a trip to Hawaii for a while. And, and, you know, with COVID and stuff, it's been interesting. And so we took our trip – to Hawaii this summer. We have 12 year old twins and they got to go. And then my mother and father-in-law got to go. And, uh, man, we, you know, when you're going to someplace like that, you might go once in your lifetime. So we made the list of all the Hawaii things you're yeah. supposed to do, right? Got to go to the little hula thing, luau deal. You got to go jump off some cliffs. You got to parasail. You got to surf. You got to do all this stuff. We were going to shark cage dive one morning, but it was too rough. We couldn't do that. So we made the list of everything and we were rocking and rolling, man, having a great little vacation, went to two different islands. And then five days in, my mother-in-law got COVID. And you're like, oh, no. And she didn't get very sick. That was good. Yeah, but uh, good. I, I know that put a damper on things for her specifically, but all of us, because mm -hmm. we had some plans. And then that next day, my son in the middle of the night got super sick. Uh, and so luckily, about five hours later, he was 100%. And then the next day, my daughter got the same thing. But then she recovered fast. So we're moving and grooving, doing all the Hawaii things. And we had a couple bumps in the road. But... Um, man, really good vacation, and I'm not very good at uh, taking days off. And when mm -hmm. I say a day off, I'm using my doing do my to do list on a day off. Um, I used Hawaii as some days off, and yeah. I didn't think about work or anything like that. And I just really was being present with my family, which is what I should do to be a good dad. So um, it was a really good experience, except for the illnesses. Chuck, what about you? I know you did something that I'm really jealous of. Well, um, I, I love live music, and um, I thought I knew a lot about music until I met you, Greg, and uh, you introduced me to a, a lot of um, kind of uh, indie type bands. And yeah. even though they're not indie, there's a, a group called the Avett Brothers yeah. that I've uh, fallen in love with. And actually, it's my fourth time to see them this summer that uh, uh, you told me about. And uh, we 
traveled to uh, Colorado to the Denver area and uh, got to see David Brothers at Red Rocks, which is um, which is if any if you if you're watching and listening to this and you've never been to Red Rocks, look at their calendar and find a band to go see because it's it's there's nothing else like it. There's not. It's it's one of the top, if not the you know, yeah. Top it's the best thing I've ever been to, and I've been to a lot of places. I mean, it's it's one of a kind. So that was the highlight of my summer getting, yeah. getting to see them. Awesome. Well, that is all the time we have for this episode of Core Values. I'd like to thank Jason Jadamski for joining us this week. And and Chuck, you're going to be here every time and we'll uh, have on different guests from around the district. We want to remind everybody that we have several other AeroVision podcasts that you can listen to. So be sure and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can listen to it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, as well as SoundCloud. You can find all of them on www.aerovision.tv. We actually have a new one, I guess, after you've been, after you've watched this, you, this one will already be out, but we actually did our first of the year. We did a entirely uh, student produced sports podcast in our six hour sports media class. That's going to be coming out today on Friday, the day that we're recording this. So I'm excited for people to see that they did everything, set up the cameras, produced, hosted. Uh, They had some softball girls on, they had some cheer girls on. And they, we also, I'm giving them a little bit of a chance to, to talk about NFL and, and college football and things like that. So to get those kids prepared. So we're really excited about we've, what we've done here in this, this new room. You know, this is a facility that we've had. This is the ninth year in this facility, but this, this space that we're in here has been just uh, equipment storage. And so I kind of, two years ago, started thinking as we started to kind of get into the podcast world, being like, all right, well, where could we make better use of this space? And it's really cool for me personally to see this, you know, come together. So I'm really excited about that. Um, But yeah, thanks everybody for listening. And like I said, subscribe to us on all those channels and we will see you next time.